All right. <laughs> thank you very much, Nathan. And of course, I want to thank the elders for presenting the Sabbath school lesson. This is our third week now doing this. Yeah, the fourth week we haven't had church, full church service here. And this is the, the third week we've been broadcasting uh, online here on our Facebook page. But uh, we're grateful that you're all able to tune in again. Wow, it's been a, a, another week of dealing with this uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus issue. And uh, things are getting quieter and quieter and quieter. So I hope all the elders that are gathered here is, you know, we're following the CDC recommendations. We only have eight people here in the church and we'll spread out. We're keeping our social distancing. And, uh, but I hope that you're all doing well in your families. And uh, we know that God will provide for us as we continue to trust him. Um, as Brother Nathan mentioned, there are several prayer requests that have come in. Uh, I'm sure that those of us who are here have several prayer requests. And those of you who are watching online around uh, Florida and also around different parts of the country, uh, I'm sure you have some prayer requests too. We want to remember uh, our families. We want to remember our co-workers, our neighbors, uh, relatives close by and distant, maybe in other countries, other parts of the country. And uh, let's continue to pray that God would intervene in the, only the way he can and to cause this coronavirus to dissipate. And that because so many people are praying, because we're praying, that this coronavirus would, uh, he would do something special. And, and that everyone who's been praying, the world would know that because we've prayed and asked him to intervene, that he will. So uh, we don't know how he will do that, but let's just keep praying that he will. And um, let's continue to pray while it's still manifested in society. We follow the rules of uh, social distancing. And, uh, you know, now they're saying we should wear a mask here in Florida. It's different, different parts of the country, but we try to do the best we can. And I believe that God will protect us in the process. So let's remember those who are, are infected at this point. And uh, let's remember all your prayer requests. So why don't we bow our heads and you, God knows your heart. He knows what's in your heart. He knows what's in your mind. He knows your burdens today. He knows your prayer requests. So let's bow our heads together and talk to him about these things. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we can come before you today on this day of rest. And dear Lord, we're coming to you, thanking you for the gift of life. Even though, dear Lord, our hearts are heavy because around us, around us, our neighborhoods and our country and around the world. So many are perishing from this coronavirus. But dear Lord, you have seen fit to keep us alive another week. And so we're grateful for that. It's a privilege, dear Lord. It's a gift that you've given us another gift, another week of life. Help us to cherish it and appreciate it. Help us to realize, dear Lord, the times we're living in uh, help us to realize what's important and what's not important. And so many of us do realize, dear Lord, how precious life is and how fragile it is and how precious uh, of all the friends and family members and, and neighbors and co-workers that you have given us, how precious they are. They have never been more precious to us than they are right now. And Lord, we pray for each other. We pray for our loved ones. We pray for the world, we pray for our government, of all the governments of the world, that you would please give them wisdom. And Lord, we know you're looking down upon us. We know that your ear is attentive to our cries and our pleas today. So Lord, please hear this simple prayer that we're offering today collectively in our hearts and our spirits to you right now and take note of it and answer the prayer in a way that you know is best. So. Please help all of those that were mentioned uh, in our prayer list today. And those prayer lists or prayer requests that have been unmentioned, but are in our hearts for all who hear uh, the sound of my voice today. Thank you, dear Lord, for hearing us. Bless us. We thank you in advance for hearing us and answering the prayers. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, 
My sermon title today is God Sees. But before I go into my presentation, <laughs> this is the time of the sermon where my, my palms and my hands get sweaty and I get the butterflies in the stomach because I told you last week that I was going to bring my German accordion and the honer, German-made accordion, and uh, play a little song for you. And uh, last week I had the Italian one, so it's a little different sound. It's, it's constructed differently. You know, the, the Italians, uh, they, they made it with love and by hand and with natural woods. And, and uh, it took a lot of, uh, you know, like an art. It's a work of art, the way it's put together. But the German accordions, they're a little more like a manufactured uh, item. You know, they have metal in it. And it's designed by, uh, you know, uh, an architect almost. And, and it comes apart. It has little components and everything. So it's a completely different instrument with a completely different sound. But I'm going to attempt to play another song today. I hope you'll be praying for me. And the song I'm going to play today is The Old Rugged Cross. All right. <laughs> Sounds a little different than the other one, doesn't it? It's a musette accordion. It's a, I'll go through it some other time when I get time, but a fascinating instrument. And 
I have to have a concert with these things. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've had plenty of time to practice, so uh, it's, a, it's a real uh, nice thing to do. But anyway, um, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for everybody prayed for me. Uh, sermon title today is God Sees. Let's just pause a moment again to pray. Dear Lord, we do pray now that your Holy Spirit would be poured out on all of us, on me as I speak, on everyone else who's here, whether in the church, church or online watching, and speak to our hearts today. Open up our hearts and minds. The Bible says that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So we need your Holy Spirit today to speak to our hearts. In the quietness of the times and of the day, speak to us today in your still small voice that we may know what your will is for our lives. When we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. God sees. Right now we are dealing with something that we've never dealt with before on such a large scale. We are dealing with a pandemic. Now, I always wondered, what's the difference between a pandemic and an epidemic? Well, a pandemic is a global outbreak of disease and pandemics happen when a new virus emerges to infect people and can be spread between people sust uh, sustainably because there is little to no pre-existing immunity against the new virus. It spreads worldwide. So an epidemic is a local outbreak of a virus or something like that, a flu. But when it gets to be spread worldwide unchecked, then it becomes a pandemic. And we're in the midst of, of a pandemic right now. But you know, there has been pandemics in the past. Our generation, this is the first one that we have seen, I think has been so severe, but there's been other generations in the past that have had to deal with pandemics. One is called the Antonin Plague. It happened in the year 165 AD, Brother Jose. <laughs> and the death toll worldwide was five million. Now, back then the world population was not anywhere near as it is today. So that was a large portion of the world who died from it. And the cause was unknown, but it says here, it was also known of the plague of Galen. The Antonin plague was an ancient pandemic that affected Asia Minor, Egypt, Greece, and Italy. And it's thought to have been either smallpox or measles. Though the true cause is still unknown. This unknown disease was brought back to Rome by soldiers returning from Mesopotamia around 165 AD, excuse me, 165 AD. Unknowingly, they had spread a disease which would end up killing over 5 million people and decimating the Roman army. So that generation, they faced their pand pandemic that killed 5 million people. Then we have, a little later on in the year 541 and 542 AD, we have the plague of Justinian. And that death toll was five times amount. It reached, killed uh, 25 million pe excuse me, people. And the cause was the bubonic plague. We've heard of that. I'm going to mention that in just a moment. It says it was thought to have killed perhaps half the population of Europe. Can you imagine? The plague of Justinian was an outbreak of the bubonic plague that affected the Byzantine Empire and the Mediterranean port cities, killing up to 25 million people in its year-long reign of terror. Generally regarded as the first recorded incident of the bubonic plague, the plague of Justinian left its mark on the world, killing up to a quarter of the population of the Eastern Mediterranean and devastating the city of Constantinople, where at its height, it was killing an estimated 5,000 people per day and eventually resulting in the deaths of 40% of the city's population. How do you think the people cope with that back then? Terrible plague, up to 25 million dead. And then, of course, probably one of the most famous and most deadly, the Black Death, as it was called. This took place over an eight-year period from 1346 to 1353, and the death toll worldwide was anywhere between 75 to 200 million people. And again, this was caused by the bubonic plague. And it says that this outbreak of the plague ravaged Europe, Africa, Asia, 
and the debt toll, as I mentioned, between 75 and 200 million people, and it was thought to have originated in Asia. The plague most likely jumped continents via the fleas living on the rats that so frequently lived aboard merchant ships. Ports being major urban centers at the time were the perfect breeding ground, breeding ground for the rats and fleas, and thus the insidious bacterium flourished, devastating three continents in its wake. Then we have the third cholera pandemic. I think there was seven cholera pandemics in the world, and this one was the most deadly, killed a million people. And it's generally considered the, the, the most deadly. And this outbreak in the 19th century, it lasted from 1852 to 1860, also for eight years. And like the first and second pandemics, the third cholera pandemic originated in India, spreading from the uh, Gang's, Ganges River Delta before tearing through Asia, Europe, North America, and Africa, and ending the lives of over a million people. British physician John Snow, while working in a poor area of London, traced, uh, tracked cases of the cholera and eventually succeeded in identifying contaminated water as the means of transmission for the disease. Unfortunately, the same year as his discovery went down as the worst year of the pandemic in which 23,000 people died in Great Britain. So here we have another pandemic for another generation. And back in the 1800s, we had the flu pandemic. It killed a million people. It was originally uh, called the Asiatic flu or Russian flu. And it was thought to be an outbreak of the virus H2N2. And I won't go into read all of this, but here another generation. And we also had another cholera out, outbreak in this country and around the world that killed 800,000 people in 1910 and 1911. And then we had the famous, what they call the Spanish flu, uh, although that's a kind of an unfair uh, calling it that because it had nothing to do with originating in Spain. But there was uh, the, the, the king of Spain, I believe, he... Uh, contracted it and so he was very famous figure so they wind up calling it the Spanish flu but that killed about 20 to 50 million people worldwide in 1918 it killed more people than World War I did which was uh, happening at the same happening at the same time and uh, it said 500 million people were infected and listen to this the mortal mortality rate was estimated between 10 and 20 percent which is which is really high and 25 million deaths in the first 25 weeks alone. So a million people worldwide a week were dying in the first 25 weeks of this flu. And what separated, as it says a little further down, what separated the 1918 flu pandemic from other influenza outbreaks was the victims, where influenza had always previously only killed juveniles and the elderly or already weakened patients. It had been begun striking down hardy and completely healthy young adults while leaving children and those with weaker immune systems still alive. You know, we, we've heard about this coronavirus. Initially, they said it's only effect, affecting the elderly and those with pre-existing conditions, or underlying uh, health issues. But now they're finding out it's, it's striking all people, young and old, uh, even when they're in the prime of health. So we need to be careful. We need to learn from the past. And um, this is interesting. Uh, it says here that there was an Asian flu, killed 2 million people. Uh, this was in 1956 and 1958. That was the year I was born. You know, sometimes I wonder, it's a miracle that we're all here. How we survived uh, when we were all growing up, wherever we grew up, with all the pandemics and all the, the, the things going around, smallpox, chickenpox, measles, mumps, <laughs> everything else, you know. And uh, I got to thinking, you know, back in that... that um, 1918 flu, uh, my grandfathers, two grandfathers on my mother's side and my father's side, on the road side and the posterity side of the family, they both were World War I veterans. They both fought in World War I, and they were both wounded in battle. And, and you got to think, back then there was no antibiotics, but they recovered from their injuries. They were able to survive that pandemic that killed so many. They were in the military. Many mili military people died. How did I get here? <laughs> it was only by a miracle of God. We need to be thankful for the life that we have today and how God has brought us to this point today and that we're alive. Amen? But anyway, let's go on quickly. We had the Hong Kong flu uh, that killed a million people worldwide in 1968. 
And um, uh, there's one thing here I want to read here at the time, and uh, I'll see if I can get to it. Uh, of course, we have the HIV AIDS pandemic, right? That was a pandemic. Worldwide, it killed 36 million people. Many of us probably know people who had it. I remember I, I worked with uh, in a, in a, in a uh, facility up in New York City uh, on a job, and one of our coworkers got the HIV virus. And uh, at the time, you know, we were we lived in a uh, a communal kind of an environment where uh, the offices was where we lived with apartments above, and he, we all lived in the in, in the communal setting. And, and so at the time, we were wondering. We, there was a lot of unknowns at that time, but uh, I remember going through that. You remember that feeling? Uh, not too long ago, we had one, that AIDS pandemic, and it's still, still going on today. And of course, here we are today. Here we are today. Uh, could be the worst pandemic we've seen since, since uh, the 1918 flu that killed so many. We don't know yet, but we're there. It says that beginning in December 2019 in a region of Wuhan, China, a new novel coron coronavirus began appearing in human beings. It has been named COVID-19, a shortened form of the coronavirus disease of 2019. The new, this new virus spreads incredibly quickly between people due to its newness. No one on earth has had an immunity to COVID-19 because no one has had COVID-19 until 2019. While it was initially seen as an epidemic in China, China the virus spread worldwide within months. The who, that's the World Health Organization, declared COVID-19 a pandemic in March. The outcome of COVID-19 pandemic is impossible to predict at the time of this writing as of today, but we can learn from the pandemics in history to determine our best courses. These are our teachers, the Spanish flu, the AIDS pandemic, and more. So this is actually a, a electronic microscope photograph of the virus as it's multiplying in a human being's cells. And this is a close-up. You can see those little kind of a little tentacles it has. It looks like a it looks like a tennis ball with like little spikes on it. But this is an actual electronic uh, photograph that was taken of the thing we're all battling against now. And of course it's worldwide pandemic. It's uh, I mean I don't have to tell you here in the church and those watching online what we're all facing. The lockdown we're under, as I, I guess, you know, you can call it or the social distancing or uh, staying at home orders and things like that. So it's very serious. But, you know, I don't know. I've got to believe. I've got to believe that there's people asking the question, where is God in all of this? You know, is God uh, looking down upon us? Is he, is he care? People, so many people getting sick. So many people getting infected. So many people dying. <coughs> where is God in all of this? Well, I want to tell you today that I believe God knows all about what's going on. And he cares about what's going on. And he wants to help us. He wants to help us with what's going on. I'd like to go to the word of God in the book of Psalm, page, oh, excuse me, chapter 102, verse 9. Psalms 102, verse 9. It says, speaking of God, For he looked down from the height of his sanctuary... And from heaven, the Lord viewed the earth. It also says in Psalms 53, chapter 53, verse 2, it says that God looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. It also tells us in Psalms 33, verses 13 through 15, from heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. He knows what's going on down here. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on the earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything that they do. You see? God's our creator. He's also our redeemer. And he looks down from heaven. He sees and he hears what's going on. He sees everything shut down. He sees the sickness. He sees the, the, the social distancing. He sees the governments of the world trying to figure out how we could best handle handle this pandemic. He sees it all. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, it says that for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. 
We say, God's watching. He understands. He's not left us or forsaken us or forgotten about us. But he created this world and he's still watching over it. Can you say amen? He loves us, he cares for us, and he wants us to know that. An encouraging text can be found in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Isaiah 41, verse 10. God tells us through the prophet Isaiah, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes, I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's a promise that we can claim today. That God is telling us not to fear because he will help us, he will strengthen us, and he will uphold us. You see, indeed, God is looking down upon us. He sees what's going on. We can take comfort in the fact that we're not alone, but we have a loving God who cares for us and loves us. He created us, and he's still watching over us, and he still will help us. What do you say? You know, some comforting words in the New Testament from the book of Luke, chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. And these are the words of Jesus himself. He said, Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Therefore, what does it say? Do not fear, therefore. Jesus is telling us, don't fear because we are of more value than many sparrows. Now, God loves animals. He created them in the first week of creation in the Garden of Eden. <coughs> Matter of fact, God brought all the animals to Adam so he could name them before he met Eve, his wife. <laughs> so God had a, Adam had a relationship with the creatures God created before he had a relationship with his wife. So God loves animals. And it even says that here, God notices even when one falls to the ground. But he says, are you not worth more, many, uh, the price of many sparrows? So why would you fear? Because God watches over us just like he does the sparrow. And what does it say here? Jesus told us, it says, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink. Nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into bonds. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? <clears throat> you notice we haven't been getting a lot of rain here in South Florida and some of the lawns are starting to dry up. You can see that. And that's what Jesus is talking about. You know, he, he created the grass fields and, and the flowers and the creatures and the birds and it all. And, and we're worth much more than that. And he wants us to know that. And Jesus finally said here in Luke chapter 6, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. Do you know that today? Do you realize that we have a heavenly Father that loves us, that created us, that, that is still with us, is still watching over us, and he cares for you? Jesus goes on to say, but seek ye first. And see, here's the key. Here's the key. But seek ye first, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You see, Jesus told us that we have a heavenly Father that's watching over us, that cares for us. And he'll give us everything that we need if we just seek him first. 
And you know, what better time, as I mentioned last week in my presentation and the week before, can we seek God now in this time of quietness in the world? When the cafes and the restaurants and the theaters and the classrooms and the sports arenas and the beaches are all empty. We have more time than we've ever had in our entire lives at this time to seek God and put his kingdom first. Can you say amen? You know, the Bible tells us how much God loves this world and how much he loves us. And we all know the text in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world. He loved the what? He loved the world, this world, the world we're living out in right now, the world that has the pandemic of coronavirus spreading through it like wildfire. He loves this world. And he loves you and I that are on, in this world. He loved us so much that he gave us his only begotten son, his own son. Think about giving your child for someone else's child. Would you do it? But God did it. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, I was talking to my sister the other day. And way back, way back, I remember she was visiting our grandmother in New York Hospital in New York City, Manhattan. And I, I think she told me something like there was a sign there that a doctor wrote. And it said, everything is going to be okay. And even if it's not okay, it's going to be okay. You know, the things we're facing now in the world with this pandemic, coronavirus, we don't know if it's going to affect us or our families. We don't know if we'll get sick. We don't know if we'll contract the virus. But, you know, if we believe in Jesus and, and, and we have peace with him and, and he, we have everlasting life, even though we may be infected, even some of us may perish, it's still going to be all right because we have everlasting life. You see, God has given us life here on this earth, but this is just temporary. We're mortal human beings subject to death. We all will die of something sooner or later unless Jesus comes back first. But you see, even if we do die from the virus or from anything else, it's still going to be all right if Jesus is in our hearts. Can you say amen? You see... If you're with Jesus and Jesus is with you, it's going to be okay, no matter what happens. And I like this text. The Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. Listen to this now. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him, delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? <laughs> God gave us the greatest gift that he can offer, his only begotten son. So when you think about it, that was the greatest gift and the greatest sacrifice he could have made for the human race, for you and I, for the world. So shall he not? Is that what Paul's saying? He gave us the greatest gift. Isn't he going to give us other things too? Is that what he's saying? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or the sword? Well, how about the coronavirus? Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor de death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, that sacrifice that God made for us, giving his son, that was not an easy thing for him to do. Oh, no. Think about giving, as I said before, your own child life, one of your own children's life for someone else. That's what God did for us. So, that shows you the kind of love that he has for us, the kind of compassion and mercy and, 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 and concern of what's going on in our lives right now. You see, so the question for us is today, are we seeking God today with all our hearts and all our souls and all our minds? Are we putting him first? You see, we, some of us, we need to rearrange our priorities in life. You know, hey, I'm a sports fan. 
I miss the golf. Oh, I, I have to say I miss the golf, you know. My clubs are getting dust on them in my garage. And I got the accordion out in the set. <laughs> and I like basketball, you know. You know, the, the only thing I can do now is watch the next tweet by LeBron James and whatever he says, you know, or, or who else. But, and, you know, the football, you watch ESPN, the football, the, the only thing they got to talk about is the upcoming football season. And everybody's signing a $50 million contract and a $75 million. They're acting like everything's fine. <laughs> And just hoping against hope that this is going to be over by the time football season starts. But uh, we don't know if that's the case. But you see, before all of that comes back, and I told you this last week, before all of those things come back and rushing into our lives and minds again, I got to believe that, that hopefully sooner rather than later this will be passed. We'll have to learn from it. We have to change some of our ways we conduct ourselves. The world may be a different place like it was after 9-11. But, uh, but let's not let this opportunity pass this quiet time to consider and contemplate our relationship with Jesus, with God. And I told you, present to you what I did last week as I close. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Jesus gives us an invitation. And he's still giving us that invitation today and right now. So I want you to be praying here in the church and those of you who are watching online where you are, this is an invitation for you today. It's an invitation for me. It's an invitation for all of us. Jesus said, Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you shall find what? Rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Are you burdened today about this coronavirus pandemic? Oh, I am. I gotta be admit, I am. And many people are, and I think everybody, the whole world is in concern. We're kind of, it's a heavy weight upon us. You know, when you wake up in the morning, you look at the beautiful sunshine, a beautiful day here today, waking up, and you go outside, and initially you think, oh, everything's okay. Oh, oh, even when you wake up in your bed and you open your eyes and see the sunlight coming through the window. Oh, it's a new day, and all of a sudden you realize, it's like this big cloud over your head. Coronavirus. <laughs> you know, something we're so used to getting up and going, right? Going out and working, going out and doing things, going out and whatever. But not anymore. That, that, all of a sudden, that's like a cloud. It's coronavirus hanging over. We, we are heavy laden. But Jesus says, come to me today and I'll, I'll, I'll lighten that burden. Learn of me. Seek me. And everything will be okay. What do you say? So if that's your desire, whether you're here in the church, a few of us that are here, whether you're watching online. I want to appeal to those of you who are watching online in the weeks you've watched me. If you haven't stood for Jesus, stand for him today. Oh, don't be embarrassed. If you're watching with your children, set the example. Lead them. Show, show them the way. Show them that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And stand for him today where you are. If that's your desire to surrender your life to him. Let us stand together and let us pray together. Oh, dear kind Heavenly Father, we're living in different times for sure in the world than we have previously known. We realize that other generations before us, some of our grandparents, and maybe even some of our parents have experienced some of these pandemics, some, some worse than others, but they've experienced it. They know what it's like to have fear grip them and have the uncertainty of their future health in lives and families' welfare in, in mind and upon their hearts. And we're there today, this generation. We are here today with those anxious thoughts and anxious feelings. We don't know what the future holds, dear Lord, but as the song says, we know who holds the future. We know that you told us not to worry. You told us not to fear. But we are worrying. We are fearful. We can't stop worrying. We can't stop being fearful, Lord. But we believe that if we come to you, like Jesus has invited us to today, that you will give us rest from our worries and from our fears. So as we're standing, dear Lord, we're telling you in our hearts that we want to 
know you. We want to come to you. We want you to give us rest today. We want to give you our burdens today. We want to take your yoke upon us because you said it was easy and it's light. So Lord, in this simple, simple fact, simple act of standing today, we are showing you and the entire universe that we mean business and that we're serious about this step of act of standing. And we expect and we believe that our lives will change for the better because we have done so. So I do pray, dear Lord, that you would bless all within the sound of my voice and that you would continue to help us as we face each day in the future from this day forward and help us to have that hope, help us to have that peace, help us to have that trust because Jesus is with us. Thank you, dear Lord, for hearing us. Bless us now until we meet again. Put a hedge of protection around all of us and all of our families and loved ones and our friends and neighbors, co-workers, and around this world. And continue to watch over us. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, Will. Lord willing, we'll see you here next week. We have a Bible class at 10, and then again our presentation at 11. We'll see you next week. God bless you.